but I never felt comfortable in my own skin. So when I was in elementary school, I always felt like I was different than everyone because of my skin color, because of my race, because of my name. You know, I always felt apart from everyone. And I always wanted to fit in. I would do whatever it took to fit in with the, with the cool crowd. I, I've always had obsessive behaviors as I was growing up. I first got into Pokemon cards, then video games. You know, anything that was going on, I wanted to be like the best at it. You know, that's where I found, that's where I found my belonging. One thing that was definitely lacking in our household was that family, that unity that comes with a family, that structure, that sense of security and um, just that love. My parents were very emotionally detached and I never, I never felt that love from them. Um, I knew that they did love me, but it was never really expressed as other families did. So, um, as a kid, I was, I was very anxious, I was very nervous, um, I was very, I would cause a lot of trouble, and I think that had to do with all the tension that was at in my family at home with my parents constantly arguing they never got along uh there was always fighting and turmoil in our house and as a young kid there was nothing i could do about that so i think i reacted towards that by acting out in school and as a kid in school i would mess with other kids i would probably end up in the principal's office every single day. I would steal things, I would cause trouble, I would do what I was not supposed to do. There was, and, and as a result, I got expelled from a couple schools when I was a child. And that behavior is not something I, I did intentionally knowing what was going on, but it's what made me feel good. I liked acting out, I liked getting away with things I shouldn't have. That, that was just my personality, that be became part of my personality. So I always felt I didn't belong, I always felt like there was something missing, something inside me just wasn't right, I wasn't like other kids, I felt, I felt like I was alone, a loner, while everything was perfect for other people. and. That really had an effect on me because I pretty much I kept to myself. No one really knew me, and I didn't let people know me because I just I felt like there was no point. Definitely, I thought took a toll on me because I felt like people were picking on me or looking at me differently. So whatever I could do, whatever substance I could get my hands on, I would put into my body um, so that I wouldn't have to deal with me and how I was feeling. I got introduced to marijuana in freshman year of high school and I tried it for my first time and I didn't feel it for my first time but I knew that I had done something that I was against when I was growing up I knew that I, I always was told say no to drugs I was told stay away from those it's not good but you know I always had a rebellious side and I always felt like I had to do the wrong thing you know it was kind of like a rush for me I always wanted to go against the grain. So it took no longer than two more weeks for me to try marijuana again. 17 years of age, I had a car accident. Um, I was not under the influence that morning. I had been using and drinking the night before, um, but I wasn't in my right mind. I ended up uh, running a stop sign and uh, hitting somebody who was on their bicycle. Later it was found out that both of us were at fault and also the city was at fault because the stop sign was obstructed, but I, you know, I wasn't paying attention and when, when he lost his, he didn't lost, lose his life right away, but he was on life support and a few days later he passed. And this is something that I carried around with me for pretty much all of my, the rest of my adolescence and into my, um, Adulthood, I pretty much I felt guilty that somebody had lost their life as a result of me, and and um, 
I went on to deal a lot of drugs, use a lot of drugs, everything. I got to the point of life where I thought I was a functioning addict because I was, I was still able to pay the rent and I was still able to make it to certain particular jobs that I was working at, but in the long run I ended up getting evicted from my apartment and I lost my car and still that didn't change me. What ended up happening was I ended up moving back to my mom's house in my late 20s and pretty much pulling the wool over her eyes and taking advantage of her for not knowing about the disease of addiction. She she didn't want to know that her son was on drugs and I did my best to make sure I manipulated her well enough to where she would keep taking care of me. I would do all the things that were necessary in, a, in order for me to stay in her house, but I was um, using in excess. I thought that I was moving in with her to get well. I moved in with her and got worse and it got to the point where um, the Orange County Methamphetamine Task Force ended up raiding her house. I was arrested once again, finding myself in another jail cell. And although, you know, I could have told myself all day long I want to get well, I wasn't getting well. I I remember sitting in my in my uh, cell block thinking, when you get out of here, be a good, be good. Just do do the right thing. Don't don't keep messing up. Um, and I would attempt to do it, but when I would get out, you know, the disease of addiction was still within me. And I, everything that I thought that I wasn't going to do, I would do anyway. And that pretty much was how my life resumed for the next five years, five plus years. I was crashing cars regularly. I was ending up in more jail cells regularly. I was, um, you know, it got to the point where I was disowned by my mom, and when she when she told me that she didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore, and I needed to go find help and get help on my own, I found myself in turmoil because I, at this point, you know, not having my mother in my life, it meant a lot to me, and I knew that there must be some kind of, I have to do something. There there was a turning point where, where I reached out for help, and even so, when I tried to call her, she she wouldn't help me, and I ended up. Uh, talking to somebody else who put me in contact with um, with a house in Irvine, which was a, re a treatment facility at the time, and, and um, after nine days of detoxing um, myself at a friend's house, uh, I ended up going to this house, and you know, you may call it a coincidence, I, the house that I went to actually was being run by, and, uh, by a man that I went to, whose house I went to years ago that was a sober living, and at this time I had no money, I was bottom of the barrel, drug addict, living out of my car, went to his house, I wasn't fully surrendered but it didn't take what long for me to realize like I need to get help and I couldn't afford it so this man helped, there was a foundation that had been put together for Iranians um, that some people had donated money and basically helped me with my first month of treatment. And that's, I, I, at first, you know, being an addict, I, I felt like I, had, I was missing out on a lot of things in life and I needed to get to those things, but it didn't take but two, three weeks. I was sitting on some lies in there and some reservations and um, they ended up processing me in a group, which was very necessary, uh, where I figured out that I'm a total liar and that I still have reservations and I still want to be used. And after that, um, there was another group that, they did a psychodrama, which also was very necessary, and it was a turning point, a major turning point in my life where I completely changed. I I had to relive my day of my car accident where I hit the kid. This is something I've been carrying around with me for many, many years. And after you know walking around the room in a family group at that treatment center, um, and my mom was sitting in the group too. She hadn't come to visit me for a couple of months, but when she finally did. Uh, I basically poured out all my tears and um, they put somebody underneath a sheet and uh, it was a, one of the people's kids to basically reenact the, to put, to say basically this is the guy who you hit on his bike and look what, get down on your knees, talk to him, tell him what has become of his life and then tell him what's become of your life and by doing so it was... Um, it felt like a thousand pounds had been lifted off my back and the next day I told my counselor, I said I, I've, I would have never been able to change my life if I didn't do this 
in doing that, he made he had me make a commitment that I need to change my life 100% and completely. He invited me to go attend college, and I went to Saddleback College to become a drug and alcohol counselor, and I finished in the top of my class at Saddleback, um, and I was on the dean's list, and this is coming from a person who who I used to go to art school, to an actual university for artists, and I'm an artist, I failed out of there because I was under the influence the majority of the time. So in going to a, another school now, you know, at, to my surprise, I was finishing the top of my class. I know why. It's because I was sober. And, you know, at this point, I take my recovery very seriously. Sometimes I feel like I take it more seriously than others because the way I use drugs, I use I use drugs and took those that serious, so that's how I do my recovery. I, I work with... Um, I made a commitment to my counselor back then that I would help people, all different types of people. I don't care what race, creed, color they are, but I'm, I'm always there for them. And, and seeing you know, the transformation that happens in some people's lives that want to get well, I remember where I came from. And I continue to do this. I know that there's a lot of people out there that are, that are somewhat deprived of um, getting treatment or help because they can't afford it. They don't have insurance, and I think it it's uh, a waste of talent when we when we can't help fellow addicts, alcoholics, or we incarcerate them as a form of punishment. Because obviously, when I was incarcerated for so many different drug charges, it never changed me. As a matter of fact, I remember thinking as a as a young um, adolescent in juvenile hall that this is what they do to me. They put me in juvie, and now I, they want me to change my life. I'm not dis. I'm not getting disciplined. I'm just going to re rebel against society, which was no excuse. But now I'm seven plus years sober. Life is very well. I'm completely grateful for the ones who who donated to help me in my first month of treatment. After that, I was able to um, build my relations with my family and have them help me. My mom decided to. Finan financially cut me off. She took away my car, school, my apartment, and everything. And that forced, that gave me two options. Either I would go into rehab or I was on the streets. I was on my own. And I couldn't, I didn't want to go on the streets. I, I was like, okay, I'll go to rehab. I'll satisfy them for a little bit. And then I'm going to come out. I'm going to do my own thing. I went into rehab this immature little girl with entitlement issues, um, spoiled. I, I felt like the world owed me something and I took out everything on people, on those people around me. And when, um, when I went in there, there was definitely a lot of times that the only thing I want to do was to get out of there. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be sober. And I made I made that clear, but at some point, I don't know what happened. Some something about being sober, it it like it opened new doors for me, and I started to see more of the positive of sobriety, and just not just sobriety as in not using, but recovery as a person from within, because I started listening to people sharing, and I noticed that. They were telling my story. They knew how I felt without me even telling them, and that was that was amazing to me. I didn't I didn't understand it. I thought someone had I didn't I didn't understand how they knew how I felt. So I started listening more and more and more, and slowly things started to make more sense. And you know sobriety and recovery gave me a different look on life and I think without that without that transition of the way I look at things and the the support I have around me there's no way I was going to stay sober being in treatment for six months and then actually going back and help helping them as a volunteer and then I started working in various treatment centers all throughout Orange County and at this time in, in Los Angeles I have a uh, sober living it's an advanced sober living we have one house that's completely full we've only been open five months it's called PIR um, sober living pioneers in recovery and I uh, started this place with 
the person who was actually my psychologist and helped me through many of my issues and my early recovery. And uh, we work with all different types of men of all different various age groups and all different types of addictions. Everything from sex addiction to gambling addiction to porn addiction to drug addiction to alcoholism. And, you know, we address their issues. I am helping them with uh, life skills and learning how to build their lives and, and do things with themselves. I'm also doing some life coaching you know, as a business on the side. This coming from a person who couldn't even manage his own life seven seven or eight years ago, now at this time is actually helping other people get their lives together. And, and I teach them recovery like recovery was taught to me. Life today is beautiful for me. I wake up, I get on my knees, and I pray to God to guide me through my day and to give me a good day. When I walk outside and I see the air and the weather, it's just, I feel grateful today. I see life a lot differently than I did before. When I see people walking down the street, I give them a smile and I say, good morning, hope you have a great day. I contact my family on a daily basis and I wish them a beautiful day as well. When someone cuts me off on the freeway, Instead of thinking, what the hell is this person doing? Do they not know who I think I am? I, I think to myself, maybe they're just having a bad day. I hope they have a better day too. I'm grateful for the things I have, and I'm grateful for the things I don't have. I still have troubles today, you know? I'm not perfect. When things don't go my way, I get upset. But I have the tools today to get past that. I have the tools today to respond rather than to react to things that I don't like. I could help people today. I could be of service and I could I could be there for someone that needs help. And this is one of the best feelings that I've felt in my life. Being able to get out of myself and to be there for another person in need makes my problems trivial. And I'm very grateful today. I'm very grateful for the life I have. I'm very grateful for the life that I don't have. I know it could be a lot worse for me. I know I could be a bum on the streets or I could be a vegetable, anything. I'm grateful to have my legs. I'm grateful to have my arms. I'm grateful to be healthy. These are the things that bring me joy in life is the simple things, being grateful. It's a wonderful world and I just, I really enjoy um, living in it.